It's the Jim Fannin Show. We've come to take your mind. Am I still on? talk all things Dominican, all things real estate, all things legal shield. Buckle up and welcome aboard. Yow. And this is where you find my man on the fake book. Let me just switch up here and I'm you know I do all this production myself here so I got to make sure the music is off and then I bring the sound up on my boy and this is him on the Instagram this is his website mariafamrd.com all the links are in the show description DR Legal Shield is over hey we're going to talk about that and Mario's got a new listing in New York City and I thought this was a uh, pretty sweet marketing strategy. I'm just going to play you a quick, it's 30 seconds, but it's, it's, it's not that big of an apartment, even, you know, New York City, right? So here's Mario Fama's, one of his latest videos, and you can judge for yourself. Hi guys, I'm here in New York City to show you a big spacious apartment in the East Village. Take a look. This is your closet area here. Then you can do like your kitchen area right here. Then you can do more closet space or living and use this as a living dining area. And then this is your bedroom where you can fit a full-size bed. I'm kidding, this is a closet in the Dominican Republic, the size of a New York City studio. Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> and you're doing some production on these. Unmute your mic there for me, brother. Uh, you're doing a little bit of video production on these. Are, is that you or you got a talented guy that does this for you? I mean, that's I mean, I'm an iMovie kind of guy. If my video editing skills go beyond iMovie, I'm finished. I'm done. Who's doing it? Who, you got a little stinger on the end there. So I know you didn't make that yourself. Um, so I have the microphones that I use. I bought the professional mics, the JLC, whatever that everybody uses with the little bunny ears and stuff. So I bought that, but I have the guys who do my social media. So they've been editing it. They put the writing. Cause sometimes a lot of people like to listen to podcasts, or look at videos and they like to read on the bottom. Uh, especially people that maybe they don't speak the language and learning English is easier for them to do that. So I do have people doing that. Uh, because I just don't have time. You know, I got so much creativity, so many things that I want to do, but I'm also managing my firm now. I used to have managers so and now I manage everything myself. So I'm managing that. I am co-manager of the law firm that I have. I'm relaunching the Mario uh, Cressman luxury brand out of Santo Domingo with my partner there. So you can imagine. I am here. I'm there. I am everywhere. You oh. spread kind of thin. Uh, that's great. Oh, man. no. I have four offices before. This is nothing. Oh, I really? Four okay. offices all yeah. over the Dominican Republic. This is great because most of my stuff is based out of just my office in Punta Cana. So that's why I'm there Monday to Friday now working and everything. How are you finding the learning curve in a new industry with a law firm? I know you've had some help there too, but how has it been different building something from scratch in a different field that you're not accustomed to? Well, 
I never graduated, but I went to, uh, what do you call it, to uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I wanted to be a lawyer at one point. So I've always had a passion for being a lawyer. That's my other calling in life that I just didn't go with. Uh, and then passing the bar exam in the United States is kind of hard compared to being a lawyer here. We just like, <laughs> right? Um, anyway, so, and then my partner, who's the actual attorney, I'm the spokesperson, and we have two attorneys. The, the main attorney was my partner. We have a junior attorney that speaks English, French, um, and he has helped me through so many legal problems and other friends of mine here all the years my divorce you know you know the, the, you don't people don't realize you imagine this you're in a foreign country right and you're married right but you never really feel protected by your wife and you you know even though you know the culture the language a little bit and everything like that you're you're, you're sailing on the dominican ocean by yourself and then all of a sudden like you're hanging out in your house after you separated with your wife you don't know what's going on and then this guy knocks on your door and he serves you with papers and it's all official with the security guard from put the kind of village where the baguacil and they give you the paper and you're like oh my god court and i don't know if any of you guys have ever been to dominican court it's some shit you see in the movies that looks like some real third world. Like you get up, and you don't know if you're getting locked up. You don't know. I didn't do anything, but that doesn't mean anything. Right. Like it's very, especially like anyway, here where I went the first time, it's very like, it's, it's, it's very, if you don't have like the heart of steel, you're like, I don't care, man. You don't know the laws. You don't know the procedures. You don't understand anything. So he's been my right hand man for seven years, you know, since 2017. He always helps me out. He's helped out my friends. So I have this experience, right? So even though I'm not an attorney and I don't like giving, you know, I'll talk to you like legal advice as a friend, but I always say, talk to the attorney first. I could be wrong, right? I could just tell you based on my experience, but there's sometimes the little things like, well, no, Mario, in your case, what happened? They said A, and that's why that happened. If somebody says B, right. then you got to go on a different way. Ah, okay, okay. But I've had a lot of legal experience owning the company here because this is a very litigious society, this country. People don't realize that, right? But like my girlfriend's mom had a partner just right now on the way here to do the podcast with you and had a partner who bought like two things to the business, whatever, did a verbal agreement. The lady left because she sucked. I don't know what happened. And then sued for like nothing. They sued for like a million pesos or whatever. Here people sue for anything and everything. And if you are a foreigner, if you have a pro property that you own, if you have a car that you own, if you're just not like a backpacker, right, they will come for you any chance they get he, he looked at me wrong i want a million pesos you know so you have to understand the laws of how things work here and it, i've learned a lot about insurance also which is the next step that i'm going to get into but that takes a little bit of time um you know like a lot of, again a lot of people don't know today there's a 500 peso policy that i add on to my full coverage to my car which covers me up to 5 million in case pesos in case somebody gets hit i hit somebody somebody hits me from the back and says that i ruined their life and they try to sue me for more than the policy of my car i actually have an additional 5 million on top of that so i've learned all these things legal and everything through experience so i definitely enjoy this and as you know i'm super pro expat uh not just here in dr but i'm pro expat you know i've learned a lot over the years living in latin america and i travel to panama I'm a panamanian resident i go to colombia a lot and i've kind of learned a pattern of how we are seen and everything like that so i've become very very pro expat because somebody's got to do it right and i love helping people in the legal aspect of you know i it, boils my blood when I see like, oh, I, I was pulled over in the roundabout in front of Jumbo in Puerto Plata because one light was out. They wanted to take my car. No, they legally can't do that. And they're taking advantage of you because you don't know the law and maybe don't speak the language. So every time I see that, I'm like, come on, man. You know, I love, I love, I love being able to legally help people get out of issues and out of problems. So it's a passion. It's not just like a business that I opened up because hey, if I want to do that, I'll sell cars. I don't know. I can do a lot of different things for money, right? But it's not for the money that I'm doing it. I really, really want to help people in the legal aspect. And if anyone's ever dealt with lawyers in this country, it is horrendous. Mm -hmm. They literally take your money and just disappear. They'll right. take your initial money and they'll just leave you hanging. Right. Have you ever been to, have you ever been arrested in this country? Yes. Uh, I don't want to say the word arrested. I was detained right. uh, for being on the beach during COVID. So oh, we sure. were in Bavaro Beach and I was staying in Playa Turquesa, which is a condo right on the beach. And it had right before, you know, now and before it had a, as a restaurant. So part of the place is a restaurant. Right. And, you know, you know how things are here today. It's gray, but tomorrow gray is not OK. Mm -hmm. So it was Semana Santa, man, during a pandemic. We're on the beach. It was just us that lived there, Dominicans and expats that lived there during the pandemic. Nobody was on vacation. So we're there. We're drinking and we're having fun. Semana Santa. The Tuesday, I think, or Monday after, like, Semana Santa or whatever, I'm sitting there in a chair, just me and my shorts, my beach shorts, on the property of the condo that's closed, right? And all of a sudden, like, a cop comes up with his 
coronel or whatever. And he's like, you're being detained. I'm like, for what? He's like, you're on the beach and it's uh, toque de queda. He's telling me, blah, 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 whatever. I'm like, yeah, but I'm on private property here. I'm, I'm like on the condo, even though I'm on the beach, I'm on the condo right. where I live. I live right here. Yeah. He was like, there is no private property during the pandemic and you got to go. So they took a whole bunch of us in the back of the pickup truck. Like you see, they do it. Everybody here. They took us to the jail cell. I have videos. I have photos of that. Actually, I st- I kept my camera in there. So I have it with a whole bunch of guys in the cells and everything. We look like crazy Russian hit and Dominican hitman and everything. Cause I have no shirt on. These guys have no, we got picked up on the beach. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm the only one that had the phone, so I had them calling their families to tell them where they're at to pick them up, and they just let us go. Like at four o'clock, they're like, "No beach." Okay, commando. Yeah. Yeah, I so appreciate that. Was pretty that. Much it. That's, that's, my that's story. <laughs> one experience I don't want to have to go through down here. That's for sure. So I'll do everything. But uh, yeah, I got a. Buddy. You ever get detained? I'll give you a tip. You ever get detained here? Have somebody bring you prodom. You know what prodom is? No. Oh. Uh, you prodom mean tequila? Is- no, no, Prodom is like a, the, you get it from the pharmacy. It's the pill you take when you have diarrhea, so it keeps you from shitting. So make sure you take that, because once you see the bathrooms in the jails here, you don't want to go to the bathroom. <laughs> have them give you a couple of those, and you just won't shit for like a week. <laughs> I got a buddy down here, thank God, and I don't, if I ever get in trouble, I'll be calling him. I won't be calling the lawyer, because he's just a really connected kid, beautiful kid, big smile. Like, what is it with the Dominican guys? Their smile lights up the street down here. It's amazing how friendly these guys' faces are. They smile at you for no reason. I had to, remember I get him gas. I pull up. A guy passes me in a bike, and I'm like, is he laughing in my face? No, he's just happy. And I'm like, there's no, like, there's no SSRIs down here. They don't take the, the happy after breakup pill. That's like, not a, even a thing down here. You think about what a pill-popping society North America is, and they, they just seem so happy. And, you know, I go down to my motor coach. Well, I don't, my motor coach, you know, Ricardo, down at the bottom of the hill, trustworthy guy, great guy, speaks English, has been one of my best friends since I lived here. And, uh, you know, one day I walk up, he's got his arm around a guy, and they're just busting balls. You can tell, you know, and the mannerisms, you can, even though I'm learning the language, there's so much you pick up with the mannerisms and the voice inflection, just the way these guys are operating with each other. And they're just razzing the hell out of each other. And so I ask, after he leaves, I go, hey, Ricardo, you, you know this guy a long time? No, I just met him. You just met him? Yeah, he just pulled up. He was asking me, blah, blah, blah. And these guys were acting like they've been friends forever. It's an amazing culture shock down here. Well, a pleasant one for me. Well, it's also a Caribbean thing. I, I don't think, I don't know if people are like that. You know, when I think about it, Panama, they're much more serious when I go to Panama. They're just, you know, nice, but very, like, professional. And I find, so I'm a lot like that because I've been in the culture so long and I've been here so long. And I find it weird because I found them the most weird in Panama. Panamanians are fairly dry. They're like Costa Ricans, right? Very nice people, very straight to the point, professional and everything. But they're not there for the church, as we call it, right? So I'm very like, hey, blah, 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 blah. In the store, I start talking to everybody. I can start talking to cashiers. It's just my way. My business partner in New York hates it. He's just like, oh, God, shut up already. You know, so what do you call it? But what I found is that that's a Caribbean thing a lot. Even like I have to reflect the Medellin. Medellin is very nice and everything. But they're not as like, yo. And then I have obviously like 95% of my friends here are Dominicans. So when we hang out. That's all it is. Everybody's joking, smiling, telling a story about this, bringing that up, that thing in the news. It's always like everybody's laughing. Everybody's like joyous. It's not like a sad thing. You know what I mean? It's like, or it's nothing like serious. Like the conversation that we have when we're hanging out is always like just chercha. I want chercha, tu sabes. Like it's just we're having a good old time, busting balls and just having fun, talking about everything, laughing at that thing on the news, laughing about that thing or whatever. That's just Caribbean culture, I think, you know? Awesome. I'm coming down and see you end of July. I'm going to stay in the place that you recommended. I found a little place, Airbnb on the beach. But uh, give me your forecast. They're building like crazy in Sasu. I know you know you know a little bit about the North Coast, and I call it small small town Dominican Republic because all down the North Coast, it doesn't matter where you go, it's all small town. And I'm a small town right. guy. You know, I liked hanging out in the big cities. They were great to visit, but I'm, I've always been a country boy, a small town kid. You know what I mean? Even in St. Catharines, they're one of the biggest cities in the Niagara region I was it's still it's 150,000 people for it's pretty much a small town so for all the building they're doing on here and I've seen it all over the world in different spots in different times decades and stuff like that where they just built the shit out of it and then the buyers went away and the glut was there and the properties crashed and everyone got stuck holding a bag if they had to sell they took a beating so how do you see the development of the north coast and do you think there's a risk that they're overbuilding Well, there's a risk of overbuilding everywhere. And uh, the thing is this, 
every excuse me, every time I talk to you and every time I do uh, my videos and stuff, I always talk about location, 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 which is the first thing you learn when you start real estate, right? Now, if we think about it, things that are in a good location, and you know the North Coast better than I do, they fared fairly well, right? Now, if something happens in the worldwide market, like 2008, that, that's like, okay, all rules out the window, everybody got screwed everywhere, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's all fair and love and war when it comes to that, right? That's different. But when we're talking about the market right now in a country that's building so much, yes, you can have, well, we have that in Punta Cana. We have A, B, C properties, and there's so much overbuilding, and there are a lot of places that are vacant. Now, you have to look at who bought and why they bought, right? Now, if you buy prime property, then you're going to do well. You're going to rent it well, especially during the high season. You might do well long term, depending on, you know, when I was in uh, La Mulata and I lived there, right? In that building, a lot of people like to be there long term because of the pool, close to everything. It was nice. So you have to look at what the property that you're buying and why. And yes, there are B and C properties that will not do well. And I was talking to a client that came into my office today, right? Some things, even though they might be a good location, you know, I heard this a long time ago in the stock market. The stock market, unless you're trading petty stocks, right, you buy to hold, okay? Expect five, ten years, you know? I, a lot of people I feel bought coming out of COVID. Okay, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to sell it for two, three times more. Uh, 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 and now they finally give it to them. And like, what do you mean? I can't sell it for two, three times more. The market's bad. Well, yeah, but you're ODing, buddy. You're, you're overdoing it right now. You know, you bought a place for 250 and you're trying to sell it for 400. No, maybe it's worth 275, or maybe it's worth the same 250, 275, 290, 300. It didn't lose value, but it's not where you wanted it to be. You know, and the developer sold it to you, tal, tal, tal. And that goes back to having a real broker that doesn't just open a door or show you a thing. Look, this is so nice. You sign here now. That tells you, look, these are the pros and cons in that area. When you sit down with me and you talk to me, I, I talk to you and I'm like, do you want to live here? Do you want an Airbnb, that dreaded word that's getting me tired already? Do you want a long-term rent it? What do you want to do with the property so we can identify the area that's good for you? Then we identify the projects that are of value. There are a lot of properties here that are value, but there are also a lot that are not. And we see this in Santo Domingo. Santo Domingo did so much building that I've seen the prices level off on Airbnb. I've seen the sales prices on units level down. Now, has the market crashed? Because I know you love these, you have these, ah, the ghouls and goblins on Facebook. Oh, it's going to crash. No, but it's just leveling. We're constantly leveling here. We're going up, we level a little bit, we go up, we level. But you're not going to see an apartment that was 250. Okay, maybe it went down to 200 now, right? But the person bought it for 150. So they bought it for 150, it was once worth 250. June of 2022, we started to change, and now it's worth 200, whatever. It's still maintaining or up. It's just not at that over projection before. Remember, we're on the delay with what happens in the United States, right? So definitely, so Sua everywhere, Santo Domingo everywhere. But now you could talk about sub areas, right? We have sub markets, right? Like in Santo in Santiago, you have like Trinitaria. Trinitaria is a un pedacito, like a little thing up, up there, super ultra luxury. That's going to maintain because you got five, you know, one square kilometer and that's everything, right? And that's because of that. In Sosua, let's say, for example, Cabarete, if you've got a complex where they built, maybe Sosua Ocean Village, I use it as an example, where they built, you know, they've been building for the, since I was there in 2017, and I think they still have room to build. Well, then you have to look at that and you have to make sure you're buying something of value or that your project that you're buying is different. You know, if they're building all apartments and you buy some really nice townhouses with a roof deck and your own little pool in the back, that's a unique product, right? While everybody else was building apartments. So now you can say, well, that's worth me buying here because I have for the for my lifestyle, for the rental market, short term and long term, I'm offering a different product. So there's a lot that goes into that. I think people sometimes don't think, you know? Now, if you bought something in Playa Alicia that's on the beach right there overlooking it, you know more that market better than I am. You can't duplicate that market. You can't duplicate uh, on the cliff oceanfront apartment, right? No, no for sure. Right. So that's going to be that. Whoever bought that is always going to do well long term because you can't build in front of him because you'd have to be a fish. You know what I mean? So with that being said, unless you SpongeBob and you built in front of him, you have a value. But if there's more room to build, I know a lot of people bought in Perla Marina and Perla Marina, the prices go all over the place. But when I was there, Perla Marina had a ton of lots. Sometimes some of them overpriced at that time. And then you have my have overpriced lots now. So if they're still, you know, it better than I, I don't know how much has been developed so far, but if they still have. 70, 80, 90, 100, 120 lots in Perla Marina, if they can still extend it, I'm using it as an example, then you have to look at that and look at your product and see the value. And then you also have to look at the demand. Who's moving into your area? Where is their source of income? Are they retirees? 
you know, that's the difference between small town, like you said, and here. Here we have a mix of retirees. We have executives. We have a trade free zone that's coming here. We have all the executives for all the big chains of the resorts. And all those millions of people that you see flying into Punta Cana, 90% of them are coming into the resorts. So those guys are hiring people that make a lot of money on the high end of it, right, on the executive end. And those people are also buying and renting here. So you have to look at what your demographic is, who's going to rent your place, who's going to want to be in your place, you know, and what's the maintenance for your place. Is it a value? Is there a reason why people want to be there? There are a lot of moving pieces to buying a piece of property. It's not just like, ooh, so pretty. I buy. I don't know why it didn't double in two years. Come on. Well, what do you do? Uh, are you mostly residential? Do you mess around with uh, development land or is there anything left in Punta Cana or bu- apartment buildings or businesses or hotels or resorts or anything like that? Or are, you, are you mostly just residential? So I'm, I'm mostly resi- residential. I do do land. I have land and there is land for sale. <laughs> There's still land for sale, and when everything gets done here on this end of it where we're at, like Punta Cana, Bávaro, they're going to keep building up. they got new communities coming up behind uh, the Moon Palace uh, that's right next to the Hard Rock. They're building a massive tower hotel there. They're going to keep building on the water going up, so we've got another couple of hundred years to build here. You know what I mean? If it took 50 years to build this, we got another 100, 150 to build the whole coastline connecting with Miches. There's a lot going on. And then once you get past the Hard Rock, it looks like Puerto Plata here. You have the hills, the, the, the mountains and everything. It's gorgeous. And it's clean. It's nice and everything. All the little pueblitos there going up and stuff like that, you know? So we have enough to build. I basically do residential. Now, if somebody comes to me and says, I want a 20, sorry, not even 20, I'm joking. I want a $200 million hotel. I have the people that I can reach out to for that. But those things are very complicated. It's not like, oh, you want to see a $200 million hotel? All right, let's go down. Okay, this one's for sale here. You got to sign NDAs. It's very complicated. But I deal mostly with that, with land. And what I'm dealing is I'm dealing with developers. You know, I'm big into White Sands right now. Uh, I've got a couple of master brokerages there that I deal with, and it's a project that I like there. Uh, So I deal basically basically with Capcana up until White Sands. That's my main area of working. Nice. I just had somebody that's looking for a business opportunity that bought something in Cap Canada hasn't closed yet, but they're they're looking at ecotourism. So there's definitely a market for that here. There is. There is a market for ecotourism. But you have to also look, it's very easy to open up a business in this country. I know it's also very easy to lose a lot of money. I know. And you have to look at what you're offering that's different than what exists here. What do people mean by ecotourism in Punta Cana? Punta Cana is flat. You're going to take people up to the mountains. You're going to take them to the uh, charcos, and you're going to take them to all that stuff. But what else? There's already boogies. There's already bows. There's piscina natural. All that stuff's already here. It's saturated, right? Then you got to pay the hotels to get clients and stuff like that. Now, if you want to do ecotourism, go up towards Miches where you put nice cabanas, ranches, horseback riding and stuff like that. That's where you want to go up, If you, in my opinion, if you want to do ecotourism, not here in Punta Cana. You can shuttle people up. Obviously, you shuttle people up there, but you got to build it up there. You know what I mean? That's where I think is it, 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 like, it, Montaña Redonda and all that stuff. Oh, it's nice, man. It's really beautiful up there going towards Miches. The minute you pass like Hard Rock going up, it's stunning, stunning. And that's where people should do it. You know, But you have to be very careful and do your market research. You know, and see how many people are in the area during the high season, during the low season. Can you survive the low season? There are a lot of moving factors to this. What is your uh, what is your group, your expat group called? Is it expats living in the Dominican Republic? Correct. That's the one that I manage. Correct. Okay. I'm going to share our live. I don't do this. I'm, I, well, I don't know why my pride gets in the way all the time. Like I'm a guy that, you know, I'm a politician, a 10 time candidate. That's all we did was try to make the news, you know what I mean? Like, in, you know, unfortunately, I made the news a couple different ways back in the day. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I, I don't know what it is about posting. I try not to post every day, you know. And then today I post. It seems like my wheelhouse seems to be the cheap condos. That's what, you know, if you're under $80,000, you get all kinds of people calling and say, hey, what's this, what's this, what's this? And I'm looking for clients. So I want to post things that get uh, traction, right? So today I post, and how many guys come out and go, Sasua, <laughs> it's $79,000. And they're going, oh, yeah, like Dreamer. You know, like, I love the, oh, I, I think it's interesting. And there's a certain guy that comes on your group that is always taking pictures of Chicas, and I just come for the comments. Oh, oh yeah, God. that's the guy. <laughs> that's the guy right there. He's hilarious. Yeah. Anyways, I just posted her live interview on the group, see if we can get some traffic off it. Awesome. But uh, we're on all the platforms yeah. now on Twitter, DLive. We even started a kick account. We got a couple different accounts on YouTube broadcasting live now and three accounts on my um, 
on my fake book as well. So uh, tell us about the open house, man. Uh, White Sands, it looks like a beautiful uh, complex. What do you call them? Complexes, subdivisions? What, what are these things? These yeah, gated communities? Yeah, a gated complex. It's a gated complex with a private beach access there. And, you know, White Sands is an area where took a hit 2018 like everywhere else and you know punta cana was not developed so like uh, you know we get a lot of shit on the groups when we say punta cana everybody's like there's nothing there and i can tell who hasn't been here in many many decades because you're sure at one point there was really not much here it was a little it was a small town here right around resorts but that's all changed and now uh we have at least 16 developers inside of white sands there's still more land to be built there they're they're coming into their own right now because of all the developers they're opening up the nine hall golf course you know glow in the dark uh putting on night and stuff like that um deli market bar it's hitting its prime right now and if anybody knows me look i understand not everybody has a budget for buying uh access to the beach but a lot of times access to the beach is more affordable than you might think that's one thing but i am huge in punta cana on access to the beach you guys on the north coast have more public beaches where people can kind of just go and hang out we don't have that the public beach access points in punta cana i'm the first to tell you i live here but they're a joke they're like little side streets alleyways that you're getting into so if you're not buying beachfront if you can't walk to one of those public accesses in Corrales Corecito, you should have some form of beach access because there's so much building here and i was explaining this to a client of mine right this is how the market is. I'll show you my hands. Like, this is how we do it here, right? It's like the, we we had this many people, right? We, well, we had these many apartments, and then we started getting this many people. Now we got this many apartments and only this many people. So you're constantly expanding. You're like, you're you're trying to catch up with the with the flow, and then you overexpand. And then everything kind of sits for a while, and then it goes back to more people coming in because the more tourism we get in resorts, the more people decide eventually to come and stay in Airbnbs, the more they fall in love with the country, and the more they want to buy here. So it's a process. It's, it's, a, it's a road that people go down. We know that because we've seen how it works, right? So what ended up happening is White Sands was kind of stagnant for a while, and it has this hardcore people like White Sands because White Sands is close to everything, but you can actually sleep at night and not have to listen to bars, to all the ruckus in the streets, to the resorts, clubs, and stuff like that. So it's close but quiet right and but close to everything so now with everything that's going there it went great i mean the open house was fantabulous uh we sold a couple of properties we introduced the main point of my open house was to reintroduce people to white sands and that it has the beach access and where it's located and all the new things they have a new uh clubhouse they want to do there, olympic pool it's gonna be great so i'm a firm believer in beach access and i promote properties that have beach access you come to me and say look i want to buy this on the other side of the highway okay my guys will help you do that if that's what you're looking for but if you ask me what do you think mario beach taxes anything else eh, eh, you know what i mean like mm -hmm. I, I because that's how punta cana is built and that's what's going to be value and i'm talking about don't ask me about you know that that's a different conversation what can i buy and flip for fifty thousand a hundred thousand more that's a whole nother thing you know that's luck or whatever i'm telling you what you can buy hold that's going to bring value one to bring joy to you because if you're going to use the property i like the beach if not i'll sell you something anyway i'll include a free horse in there and everything i don't care you know what i mean you could be out there and you can drive an hour to the beach here 45 minutes when there's no traffic and you'll get it for a lot cheaper if nice. you're in punta cana you should have beach access or be able to walk to the beach otherwise vamos para santiago what uh, are some of the infrastructure projects that are committed to or even in the idea phases that you're interested in or excited about? Here, um, I would say there's a design district coming here. Downtown is going to be like Orlando eventually. They're going to build a lot right now. They built a lot. It's empty kind of right now because it's in that phase where like who wants to be there? A lot of units built. But the plan that they have for downtown is going to be basically the epicenter of the Caribbean, meaning malls, shopping, cafes, restaurants. They have a massively aggressive plan that they're going to do here. Build it and they will come. So that's going to be, I believe that downtown, that's why I bought my office downtown Punta Cana. Downtown Punta Cana is going to be the epicenter of the Caribbean as far oh, as just- really? You know everything i'm not i'm not talking about beach life i'm talking about everything like like just shops offices doctors offices cafes restaurants condominiums mm -hmm. uh communities they're building all the way to uh cabeza del toro they're doing a die golf course there because they just bought it from catalonia all that stuff's gonna be one interconnected giant hub of the caribbean and latin america mm -hmm. so that's what i think i'm excited about that i'm excited about the train that it's a private project because i know we're gonna get a lot of comments <laughs> 
listen, if it was a government project, I would say the same thing. I have, I don't even have faith the water's wet sometimes, you know, but it's a private project and they're doing phase one, uh, Santo Domingo de Santiago, phase two, Santo Domingo to Punta Cana, but they said they're going to do phase two before phase one, which why wouldn't you call that phase one then? <laughs> if it's the first part, <laughs> but I'm super excited because Santo Domingo connected with Punta Cana with a train with 58 minutes from Santo Domingo here with stopovers in San Pedro, La Romana, Iguay, and then getting here. And then they connect Santiago to that. Uh -huh. That's it. That's yeah. like that. When that happened, it's like there's a show like on TV that when he's like uh, the talk shows, you know, with the judge and everything in Spanish. Caso cerrado. Yeah, case closed. When that happens, that's going to be the boom that we're waiting for here. They said they're going to build it all over the country. It's going to connect the North Coast, Monte Cristi, and all that. And then another thing I've heard is I've heard there might be an international airport coming to Monte Cristi. The power plant is up. A whole bunch of resorts signed on to some big stuff there. So really? if anybody wants to know something that nobody knows about, Monte Cristi might just be. If it happens, remember, I said it first. <laughs> And you can't get beat for insider trading with just a little bit of knowledge about new developments coming. It's that's what realtors get paid to do. You got to know where it's happening so you can, you know, plan your clients to plant them early. And you're right. It's a buy and hold game. Anybody that thinks they're going to buy and flip properties, even in North America, it's a tough racket, man. You got to steal the stuff in the beginning. You got to make sure that every goes, everything goes as planned and your contractor doesn't rape you on the way. And then you got to get lucky in the on the sale time when you're punting it. You got to find a good buyer. So, yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a lot easier than it sounds, I think, flipping properties for sure. I try, I've done it a couple of times, but, it, you know, for the time that it took me away from real estate, my mother said when she was a manager at REMAX, manager of the year a couple of times over at REMAX Garden City, she said, just go sell a couple more houses. I mean, do you, you would have made more selling a couple more houses, and you probably lost six deals doing this flip. So keep your head in the game. I'd rather build here than do that. You know what I mean? Have develop, have a builder to build for me. Be like a, it's called so, uh, promotora. I don't know if you know the difference between a builder and a promotora. I don't. So a builder is the guy that actually hires the workers. He's there. He builds. The promotora is like I'll give you an example. Let's say I buy a piece of land right now. So I buy you know two thousand square meters and I want to build five townhouses on it, right? So I hire the builder. The builder charges me a per square meter price to build, and then I obviously I sell it at market value. So I am the I am the developer, but I'm not the actual builder. I'm the promotora. So I'm kind of like an intermediary. I'm the one that gives it to the broker. I pay them the commission. I do everything, but I actually somehow contract the the the, the, the builder. Because it makes no sense for me to hire a whole bunch of team, pay them ta taxes, to hire them, liquidate them when I'm done with this project. So I don't know when my next project's coming along. You understand? And also just also for just tax purposes, for many different purposes, it's much better for me to hire one company that just builds. That's all they do is build. Gotcha, man. What else are you working on these days? You must have been really busy. I know these open houses are, are a lot of work, you know, throwing a party and organizing it and all that kind of stuff and getting invites out and stuff like that. So now that that's behind you, what are you concentrating on? Another one. And uh, for what do you call it for, uh, what is it, Labor Day weekend? Oh, yeah. I want to do another one. We're, we're going to continue to do them in White Sands. We have a lot of great products coming there and developers are going to keep developing there. So I want to make this a quarterly thing just because I had so much oh. fun. We obviously, we do sales. We introduce new people to the project. So I'm definitely working on that right now. I actually was just in the studio today. I'm working on securing two hours. I want to do every two weeks. I want to do a podcast. The Mario Fama edited podcast, mm. real estate, DR life, everything out of an actual studio with the big TVs, kind of like those guys that know Alofoque is here in this country. And obviously it's not going to be PC. So if you're woke, it's gonna, nah, you might not like me, but what do you, well, they already don't like me anyway. So uh, <laughs> the same people that don't like me on Facebook, you're not going to like me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you'll find information there, so don't worry about it. But uh, yes, yeah, so I'm working on actually launching the Mario Fama there. What do you call it? Well, every two weeks I'm going to do it and see how that goes uh, mm -hmm. from the actual studio. And yeah, just a lot, man. The law firm, the law firm has been also like, you know, we started in, like, in February, I think it was, and it's just been doing fantabulous. We have the main attorney, the junior attorney, um, a lot of people calling, a lot of clients. You know, it's growing. I could definitely see this growing into a big firm. Um, our next office, we have Punta Cana, we have Santo Domingo. Our next office is going to be probably in Sosua and then uh, Las Terenas because we want to spread out throughout. You know, we help Dominicans. We help everybody. Obviously, we're in the Dominican Republic. My partner is Dominican, right? But the basis of this company was – the reason I called it DR Legal Shield, and I wasn't aware of Legal Shield, whatever, in the States. I just wasn't because I'm from New York. Oh. Nobody uses crap like that. Like, we all have, like, 
real attorneys because you can't use right. like that. that's a that's a thing it's, it's a thing you know it's a gimmick right uh -huh. you don't use a gimmick in new york if you got a legal problem buddy uh you get a real bona fide lawyer i didn't i wasn't aware of that so i just came up with dr legal shoot because the way i got that in my head was the shield protecting the expats from all the crazy shit that happens here all the people trying to take advantage it's happened to me i've seen it happen to many people you know i remember one time i got hit in the back here right before the pandemic and you know it was bullshit i was trying to sue the guy because of, he wouldn't pay my deductible or whatever and i just didn't do anything wrong and my partner now, he's in Santo Domingo. I don't want to bother him. So I went to a local lawyer and I gave him like 10,000, 15,000 or whatever to sue the guy. I was just doing it to be a dick because I didn't do anything wrong. And the guy was just, you know, he had no insurance, no driver's license, paid off the cops and didn't want to give me my thing. I was like, I don't want my insurance going up. And the guy just disappeared with my money. So I know I'm, I'm not only part owner, but I'm also a client. You know what I mean? I'm constantly having issues that I have to deal with. They stole my Volvo. I had a Volvo. People know I had a Volvo. The dealer stole my Volvo. I'm still in court right now, uh, almost two years later, trying to get the rest of my money. They owe me $10,000. They stole my car. And I have the title still. And if he crashes that car, it's my problem because under my name. No shit. Wow. And he's not even supposed to be driving it. He, so I'm also a client. People have to understand right. the birth of this law firm came from me being a client. <laughs> and every time I have to sue somebody, every time they steal my commission, you know, because there's no, there's no, there are no laws here. The developer pays, pays whoever shows up at the office, and then they're like, "Well, you figure it out with the guy who stole your money." I mean, I've been robbed at least 100, 150 grand over the last five years in commissions here. Aye, so every time aye. I have to sue, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I tell people the licensing part affects me more than you. You guys uh -huh. got a license, that doesn't mean it's a good agent. But the guy's got a license. I can do something about it right now. I got to take him to court. Mm. And you know what? When it's when it's not criminal, when it's civil, in the case where it's civil, where they didn't actually physically steal the money, where it's just like a abuso de confianza, they go to court for three, four years. I took somebody to court. They admitted in front of the judge that what do you call it? That they took the money. And the judge is like, "Come on, it was five hundred dollars. You know, just case dismissed. Nobody has to pay anybody's lawyer's fees. A year and a half, two years. That person said, "Yeah, I took the money because." lied about having some other office debts or whatever the case was no proof nothing yeah i took the money yeah 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 <laughs> i have no hair <laughs> i'm yeah. prepared for dr beautiful you have a thing, like when you get to the airport do you want to do business in the Dominican republic yes i do okay so we've got a barber here he's gonna just cut your hair right <laughs> off we're gonna get that out of the way for you real quick yeah, so, so you, you don't have to pull it out look. slowly in patches one by one. Part of the pack. It's part of the package. You want to open up an <laughs> SRL? Okay, we're going to charge you this, and there's a 500 haircut fee. Yeah. Uh, what do you think the or, uh, the future organized real estate is going to be? Are they go. Are they going to organize? Are they going to legislate uh, licensing, or are we ever going to get an MLS system? Okay, so I will tell you because I don't know if you've seen my pictures with the association. I have had numerous meetings with them. And I'm still working on my cellular because my thing's a shit show. I did it with two different passports for different papers. I got impatient and I screwed myself up. But here's the problem, right? Here's the problem. I'm, I'm intimately involved in this, right? Like speaking to the people about what they want to do. And here's where the problem, they're going to create a, if they do create a licensing, they're going to create an us versus them a uh, break in the real estate market here and it's not going to be pretty i don't think uh and not in a physical sense i mean in a business sense because they require that you have a residency or a permanent residency like right now i think it's permanent residency to be able to have a license in the dominican republic ouch so what happens to all the expats that don't have residency that work as agents and as broker owners mm -hmm. but wait there's more here's the <laughs> legal concept of it right you're legally allowed to open up an SRL and register it as a real estate company. Okay. You're legally allowed to com co collect taxes and pay them. But then this association, which doesn't really have any, the only thing they can do is say, oh, they're not part of their association. I don't know if they get for right now. If they mandate by law that you need to do that, then it's like you can open up. So then what, what do you do? Do you take away the right to open that kind of SRL, like a liquor license to the expats? And then what do you do with the expats that already have it and don't have their residency, don't qualify, can't get it, or don't want it? What do you do? Do you grandfather them? Do they not? You understand what I mean? It's a very sticky situation. Is it gonna? It, that's not MLS. That's licensing. That's two different things. Right, People right. don't understand. An MLS is not going to come here. And I'll explain to you why MLS is not going to come here. MLS, and you and I both know, works. Hi, my name is Mario. I got your apartment as an exclusive. I'm the only one allowed to advertise it. Everybody else can show it. And then if you're Zillow, you just run the market like a scam artist. And you, <laughs> you know, you skim you, off the top. No, you charge. 
they charge people. No, they charge you. So this is how Zillow, all these big American companies right. work. They, you pay. I, I want a thousand dollars to have ten percent of this zip code, and you pop up on somebody else's listing, and the person doesn't know. He thinks you're the the one who captured it, and they reach out to you. you know how many times in New York I've been sitting there in the lobby, and the guy, the client shows up, and he doesn't even know who he's meeting. Because he got the guy from from Zillow, truly all these different websites all across the country, right? So I'm not, that's to me that's not ethical. In the United States, the Department of State should have stepped in and protected the consumers from doing that. They let a corporation mm -hmm. take over, break all of the rules. Meanwhile, they want to make rules for us as the agents. Now, an MLS works in the matter that you exclusively could only put one up. That's not going to happen because that's not how it works in this country. So what's MLS in essence? It is a website where everybody puts up everything ten million times over and over again, right? Point two homes is stopping here. So now the question is every another question, but everybody's gonna try to do one. But I'm gonna tell you right now, most people are not gonna succeed. Maybe somebody will. It's very difficult. I understand this. Let me decline this because I don't know. Uh, what do you call it? It's very. What do you call it? It's very difficult to do it. And the reason I say this, I worked with Agent Folio and Bifolio, which is basically Alter State right now. When they were in development, before they sold to Zillow, before Susan Daimler became a CEO of Zillow and sold her product to them. I worked as a, I was a manager from Marone Properties in Manhattan. You can look it up, Marone Properties, New York City, East Village, uh, 90 East 10th Street. I used to manage that firm. And I worked with other like Rent Hop, all these different apps that you have before they street easy, before they sold to Zillow. And I, when they were starting with all these apps, they used to come to our office and we were a cool mid-sized firm. They would host parties for us. And then I would do like consulting, free consulting for them, right? So with that being said, said what do you call it i know what it takes for an app to work for a website to work and most people do not have it now i'm also not going to give you that information for free you know what i mean what's in it for me i'm not sitting there trying to develop anybody's website and give them the tips that's going to make them rich and i don't get my richness out of it i'm done helping people i've done that many years over and whatever but i'm telling you mls website that's the last thing you think to worry about here a website like point two homes maybe that has all the properties okay cool you know there's already a dominican one supercasas.com you know what I mean? They have a lot of properties in supercasas.com. Not okay. all of them, but a lot. You know, you can go to Corotos. You can go to all these different places. And MLS is the last thing you'll ever get in this country because that requires way – think about it from this. From no licensing to only – everybody has to be a – they can't force you in this country right to work. You can't be forced to be like, oh, you guys have to get exclusives. Everybody has to give an exclusive to everybody. That's the way it's going to work from now on. No, no, you can't do that. So without that, you can't do MLS. So forget about MLS. But they're going, they're working on getting licensing. They've been working on that for a while, and it is going to exclude every person who does not have a cellula or at least a, a, wow. a, a permanent or at least some kind of cellula. So that's wow. going to create expats versus locals. And then you know what expats are going to say? They want to cut us out of it because they want to sell to you. They don't want us telling you the truth, <laughs> right? And then, the, but then that's going to create that rift, and it's going to create expats. Versus locals, which should not happen. We all here to work together. The good, the good, and we should be working on expelling the bad, not dividing people whether they're locals or expats. You're here, you pay your taxes, you have a corporation, you are good with impuestos internos. That's what matters, not that, because that's not the way that it was set up. If you want to do that, you have to have a transition period. Speak to the government. Allow a special residency for people who open up an SRL mm. and invest in an office and do what they do. Not just kind of like I'm going to cut you off right now. Good luck, sink mm. or swim. That's not fair. That's not right because we are responsible for trillions of dollars of investments in this country in real estate. I mean, think about it. Between the entire Dominican Republic, how many U.S. and Canadian passport holders purchase property, cars, goods, services, all tied into the real estate market, whether you're renting or buying, right? Mm -hmm. right. Every month, this country is at a fair somewhere. Spain, Miami, there, mm -hmm. Colombia, Argentina inviting everybody to come here and invest so we have to we should be allowed to be part of that entire thing as well you know what i mean because right. you're asking expats to come here you're asking colombians you're asking uh what do you call it venezuelans you're asking bolivians i don't know you're asking miami you're asking mexicans you're asking everybody to come here but then we can't come and get a special residency for that i don't consider that fair you know what i mean and then also there's another problem which i've expressed in private and i'll say it you have people that are part of these associ this association that want to talk about we need licenses, we need ethics. You're the same company who does not co-broke with other brokers and keeps everything in house and doesn't <laughs> want to share. The first pillar, the first pillar of ethics in real estate, co-broke. I do not respect and I do not like to talk to and I don't even like to look at brokers who don't co-broke and split 50-50 their commission because the buyer has the right to choose you 
and you can show my property. He has a right to choose me, and I show your property. The seller gets serviced this way correctly. The buyer gets serviced correctly. You shouldn't be forced to deal with that brokerage because he has the listing, and he's greedy, and he doesn't want to co-broke his. But then he'll call me and want to co-broke my property. That is the first pillar. If you fail on the first pillar of your construction, your entire house has crumbled. Don't talk to me about ethics at that point. Mm-hmm. Well, most of the agents that I've dealt with down here, at least the decent agents, and you know, you've, you've heard me use Joanne Hammond as an example, are realtors yep. in other Joe, countries. That's amazing. You know, and you always know when you're talking to a realtor that's never held a license before, never practiced real estate or been licensed in another country or whatever. I mean, there's some, obviously some good local guys here and they know the ins and outs of the local economy and, you know, you know, projects and all that kind of stuff. Yes. But I wonder if the, if the public picks up on it, they must, you know, when you don't have a trained no. agent and you go into negotiations and they don't have any strategy for you or they're blabbing your, you know, what really gets me is there's no client confidentiality. So if Bob is sick and he needs to dump his property quick and move to the States, the 10 agents that take his property are blabbing it all over the, and, you know, I try to tell my guys, listen, you got a situation here, nobody needs to know about it. And you know how you secure that? With one agent that is the guardian of all the information that goes out. And everyone that gets information has to come through me. But, it, you know, it's not a popular uh, concept down here, exclusivity, so... Well, that. Uh, it's starting to become a little bit more, right? And I think that what happens is, and I'll tell you why it's very hard. We're on the path to that, right? I think we'll see more and more, not necessarily everywhere, but we will see more and more exclusivity as time goes on because some people are realizing this. But what holds us back from this, right, is, and excuse my Francois, the piece of shit agents who do not co broke and who do not split the commission at least 50 50. i pay 50 50 all the good agents pay 50 50 and if we're master brokers we pay out more than 50 50. that's how master brokerages work because you negotiate a different commission with the seller and you're able to offer more than you know a, a better commission for the rest of the brokerage community those people again this is why i talk about the pillar that one pillar the greediness of that one pillar and those kind of people hold all of us back because it is a very well-known fact and it is all through the expat. No, these brokers don't want to co-broke and I have seen I and brokers. I know that other brokers have shown me their text messages in private where they're like, what are you offering me? Because if you don't give me this, I'm going to take them somewhere else. When I see that, it enrages me. I have 30 years of doing this. I'm licensed in New York City. I'm probably going to get my license next year in, in, in Miami, and I'm definitely getting my license in Panama, where I'm a resident as well. And so with that being said, as a career real estate professional, when I see that, it makes me sick to my stomach, and those people are responsible for that because the people are scared. Hey, I'm in Spain. I'm in Canada. I'm in New York City. I give it to you, and now you're hoarding my listing trying to keep the entire commission and not co-broking it with the entire community and you're hurting me so I have to give it to everybody else because I can't trust anybody because your reputation is so bad because yes there are people like that and those people should be weeded out and they should be pointed at and they should be what is ostracized I don't know if that's the word out of our community you know there's a lot of stuff that happens that's unethical people being forced into exclusive contracts telling them that you have buyers that you have this and that then they sign an exclusive and then the buyer disappears and then charging people if they want to get out of an uh, uh, of what do you call it of uh, uh, a contract with you an exclusive contract i don't charge people the only time you should charge a person is if you're staging the property or if you say hey look i'm going to pay for pictures professional pictures i'm going to do this it's explicitly written in a contract if you choose to cancel the contract the exclusive contract before x time then you owe me this much for what i paid for and i will hand this over to you as you're paying for it that's the ethical way to do it there's so much unethical way ways of unethicalness in real estate here and it hurts all of us and that's what bothers me and those people should be pointed out you know nothing's perfect look and, and, and i'm not talking about like buyers you're not going to get along with all your buyers i fire buyers all the time i teach my agents if you're not getting along with the person fire them that person might not like me they might say mario's a jerk or mario didn't show me what i want because i see what they're looking for one way they see it a different way go find another broker we're not talking about disagreements and we're not talking about stuff like that we're talking about pure unethical practices that we see here like you said telling the person this tell and now if the person wants you to tell it then that's different hey this is a fire sale he needs to move and that happens sometimes some people really need to look at they tell them i'll do uh, whatever just i need to get rid of it then they're authorizing you to do that but those kind of things come from you being a professional in this business those of us that have been doing this our entire lives the code of ethics i don't need you to give it to me i don't need to sign it i don't need an association 
This is how I do my business. This is how I live 30 years living like this to doing the right thing is a matter of internal ethics. You know, that's what I feel like. I think I don't know if necessarily in, in the United States, let's say people are ethically better, but I think the laws and the regulations keep them within a guideline here because you have the freedom to be an asshole. People do whatever they want to do and there's no repercussion to it. You know what I mean? And that just shows our nature that most people are bad. That's why we do need some form of licensing. I am all for licensing. I think it should be a thousand dollars for a license. Uh, what do you call it? Like 55,000 pesos for in a uh, license as an agent. I think it should be 200,000 pesos as a broker. That's what I think. They have a brokerage. I think that you should be able to, you should come in and have to work as an agent maybe for two years like you do in the United States. And before a broker signs off that you've done enough transactions to do it, I think there definitely needs to be checks and balances here to protect the consumers and change laws that the developers could only pay the company that's registered for the sale that has a RNSA that shows at the time of the contract that they up to date with their taxes and everything like that. Those are the things that we need to focus on, not the division between expat and local. Amen, brother. Uh, we're talking a lot of inside baseball. I feel like I'm interviewing a real estate broker at, and just talking to agents here. Um, before we shift off that, though, um, and I'd like to get to actually, let's hit that now. Tell me a little bit about why you're here and you're New York City, born and raised. Well, practically. No, I'm born, not born here. But, um, and then you made the decision to come here. What, I mean, I miss nothing of home. A couple restaurants, a couple of my buddies, my family, obviously. But anyone I talk to from back home is like, Jimmy, you're not missing a thing. Like, it's so crazy. And Canada's not much different than the States, I guess, in some ways. But, um, you know, tell me a little bit about the culture, the life, and why you made the Dominican Republic the place that, you know, you spend most of your time and you've anchored a business in and you're, you know, recruiting agents and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So basically I was born in Romania, moved to New York City in 1983 and raised in New York City. Raised with Latinos most of my life. You know, I grew up in Astoria, across the street from the housing project. So we had, I've had a mix of everything in my entire life. I've grown up with everything, right? And I don't know if you know, but Queens, New York City is the most diverse county in the entire planet. If you are from a tiniest country in the world, you have a square kilometer in Queens that you have your restaurant, your deli, your people, and everything like that. So I've grown up with everything, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Guyanese, wave your flag, wave your rock, jump on a big truck. I mean, Jamaicans. <laughs> I met my Puerto Rican baby mama at a Jamaican reggae dance hall party <laughs> in, at, the, wait, at the Ukrainian center no. that was rented out to the jamaicans in the east village nice that's where i met my first my son's mom so i mean could you imagine <laughs> you know what i mean like i mean the the the, 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 the diversity soup that i come from is is uh, unmatched in the world i would say because i'm from that that you know i grew up with everything hip-hop i was there i was there when reggaeton started watching El general at a club 15 years old i was like what's this new music a freestyle was coming out i was like what the hell is this reggaeton muevelo, muevelo. so i've been there with the culture from the beginning it wasn't ah, something nice. like like you know I, I moved to queens from from romania my next door neighbors were puerto ricans i was like <laughs> puerto rico what's that you know what i mean <laughs> that was my first friends in the united states my two kids are puerto rican so i grew up with a bunch of dominicans i you know i, I just kind of like grabbed towards that you know with the music the vibe the people you know even my friends that i got from colombia they're like yo dude could you stop being so damn dominican <laughs> that, that's just how i've always been the tight pants the you know I, I, as i started growing up i mean at one point we had a baggie but yeah. what do you call it but i grew up with that culture so when i first came here it was nothing new to me i opened up my first real estate office 2004 in new york went across the liberty travel across queens boulevard and i was like i want to go on vacation to the caribbean i had recently discovered florida and the caribbean late in my life in my mid-20s or whatever so she was like are you single or are you going with a girl i was like single she was like you want to puerto plata because it was with a girl you go to puerto cana single you go to puerto plata i went i stayed oh, okay. in Plata and i called up my boy from santiago from the block because my other boy was like oh yeah mira, <laughs> this guy's over there call him hit him on blackberry he was like yo Came, got me, took me to Santiago. I spent a week in Santiago in 2004. You want to talk about the wild, wild west, buddy? I came back and I was like, this is real life? Like, no, no, no. The wow. whole time I was there, I was like, is this actually happening? Is this like a movie? It was insanity. I can't even explain to you really? the fun that I had. Yeah, dude. Even coming from was, New York, dude. you were impressed with Santiago. It, it, it was the most amount of, I mean, it literally, do we have a 
you want to do in life. And then, you know, he introduced me to the car wash and the girls <laughs> and this, you know, all the, I mean, everything that was Santiago in 2004, typical parties. You know, he took me to freaking Andy Ranch and all of that and Kerube, Kerubanda, and I was like, yo! And because I grew up with that in New York, going to see the bachateros, the merengueros there at the events that we had. So when I got to come here and the stick of it, it was like this one white guy, and I didn't have the tattoos and none of that back then, but this little white blonde guy there in Andy Ranch sitting there with my bottle of Hennessy with the guys, and I'm just like, yo, this is crack. I was like, I'm coming back, man. I came back with the boys after that, but they all had girlfriends and wives, so they couldn't keep coming back, but I don't pay attention to anybody. I'm a troublemaker. <laughs> so I just kept coming back by myself. I opened up a bar in Santiago in 2010, and that was my first experience with dealing with people here and how business oh. is. It opened up really good, but he was on some other shit. So I got my money out of it. I didn't lose any money on that one because uh, we we're from the same block, so that wasn't happening. Uh, I got a car out of it in New York and everything. And then what do you call it? I just kept coming back by myself after that. I went to Costa Rica like two times by myself. I tried to look at other places. My boys were like, yo, you do, you and your Dominican shit. They were like, yo, go try other countries. Went to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was a very close second for me to stay because I fly free into Puerto Rico and I had a place to stay for free in Guaynabo, which is like Piantini there. Really nice, but just the, the – the opportunity here of business, you can't compare, right? Because no, you, you sure. can't do whatever you want to do. You're going to mm -hmm. lose your underwear. But if you do it right, you're going to make a lot of money. That's what it is. You either mm -hmm. lose it all or you make it all. But the opportunity, you can do whatever you want here. You can get a bicycle, a boombox, and sell cold beer and platano frito in the street. And you can make money doing that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You're going to open up a salon. Dale. No permit. You want to open My girl has a salon. I didn't even know. I go there the other day. She has a bar right next door. <laughs> she don't like, even I know. I didn't know you have a bar. <laughs> she said, I told you have a barcito. I thought it was a barcito inside the salon. I didn't know you opened the doors. I home of the bar on the other side. That takes you eight you know, months. You just, North America liquor license take you eight months to get, you know, the background eight checks months. and eight. all that kind of stuff. Dude, in your city, in your city, background check. Then you have a beer and wine. Then you have full liquor. Then you have a cabaret for dancing. You can't dance. You go to a bar that has full liquor, that has a sign, no dancing. What am I supposed to do? Sit in my chair and go like this? The whole time because I can't dance. And then the community board has to approve you. And then there's one fight outside. The community board shuts you down. I No, 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 Papa. So anyway, so <laughs> no, I started Papa. coming back by my <laughs> – I started coming back myself and then – the way I ended up here is a story you'll find funny because Joanne, John Hammond has to do with this, right? So I'm managing my own properties. I had just come back. It was 2015. I had just come back from spending my birthday a week in Puerto Plata, staying in Casa Linda. And I'm just there watching all the craziness in Clisante, drinking beer with my business partner. And I'm like, this is some funny shit. So anyway, so I'm sitting home. It's a cold day. And I'm watching Caribbean House Hunters. I used to love that show on HGTV. Caribbean house hunters, the international house hunters loved it. So I see this one, like somebody looking in Sosua, and I see a couple looking at Costa uh, Hermosa, that's a condo that we still have here. Like, we just sold an apartment there right now in Bavaros, another lady, Las Corrales. And I said, you know what? I said, I got to buy a place there because I go, then I don't go for a year, then whatever. When you have a place, you're forced to go back all the time, no matter what. So I didn't know anything about Punta Cana. All I knew was Sosua, Cabarete, Puerto Plata, and all that stuff because I started in Santiago. So that's where people, Santiagueros, Sibaeños, they go down to the beach there on the weekend. So I was like, let me do that. I looked, I found Joanne. We started talking. I came down. I bought an apartment in what do you call it? Um, in Montevista. And then I came back a month later and I bought one in the Palms right next no to your friend sure. has the bar and everything. I bought two apartments in two months. I was like, yeah, that's it. And I still started coming down. I was coming down every month. I would stay like three times, three weeks here, go back three, four weeks to New York. Whenever I had a break in work there, I would just come down. Then I met somebody. I ended up liking her. I started coming every single month after that, every holiday weekend and everything. I was just back and forth. Then I liked her. Then we, I was like, listen. I realized I was spending money like I was on vacation. I'm like, honey, we can't do this. Let's do a business. I'm a serial entrepreneur. So it came down to a salon in Bella Vista in a plaza where I actually ended up having an office in for a year and a half or a restaurant in Sosua. And she said restaurant in Sosua. So we opened up a restaurant right there next to the hardware store by Paula, right down the block from the Palms, right down where you could come out of yet, right there to the left. The oh, one yeah. that has the painting, the sandwich spot right yeah, there. Yeah. Right next to the heart, that was mine. Okay. But that typical, typical fama was mine. I opened it up with her. I lost about $80,000 through the Eey. whole spiel with her and everything because she ran it through like through the ground. <laughs> and then one day I just realized like this tank top, you know, flip flop life is not for me. I'm a city guy. I like the fun stuff. I like hiring. I was coming back from Santiago and we're coming back at night after hanging out at Monumento and everything like that. And I was like, what am I doing here? This is a campo. For me, this is no more. I'm like, let's get out of here. And I was like, let's go to Santiago. You're going to be Santiago. And she's like, there's no work for me in Santiago. She spoke perfect English, by the way. So she was like, let's go to Punta Cana because she had worked for a group of Punta Cana in the VIP in the airport there. So I was like, let's go check it out. Went to Punta Cana. I rented an Airbnb for two weeks. I found her a job through my connection in New York doing sales in the vacation clubs. And we just moved 
to Punta Cana. And then we tried to make that work, but it didn't. She left, and I was like, okay, so here I am in beautiful Punta Cana, and one of the in the newest building in Punta Cana Village. I'm loving this luxury lifestyle. I was like, can I see myself going back to New York? Nah. No. Hey, partner, so you're gonna run the New York City office, and we're gonna open up a real estate office here. And that was the end of it. Nice. Speaking of which, when do you come to Sasua? I have to come there because, like I said, I want to open up a, a law firm there as we grow. That's my next office that I want to do. So I definitely do have to come down there. I've just been so swamped with work that even like Santo Domingo, I'm not going to be going that much unless it's for business. I have to focus on managing my firm now. I had managers in my firms before, but I'm managing it right now. I need to manage this. I know what needs to be done, and I enjoy doing this. So right now, I've just been super swamped. And also, keep in mind, uh, I went to South Florida. I do like South Florida. I go to Panama a lot. I have to go in July to Panama also. Um, I'm going to New York for like two, three days just to see my mom. And I go to Medellin also, which I like for fun. Um, I was there for my birthday with my girlfriend. We spent like two weeks in Guatapé, amazing. Nice. So my plan is to be here running my business in Punta Cana and running the law firm between Punta Cana and Santo Domingo. And then on my spare time, every month and a half, I'd like to go to Panama. or just go back and forth to Panama. But I'd like to branch out there also with the company because I do love Panama City. It's like a polar opposite to how things are here. Mm -hmm. So I do like that. I'm super hyper. So I like to be in different places. <laughs> I, I like notice. jumping on an airplane. I just don't like going to Europe. That's all it is. If it's cold, don't call me for it. South Florida, I'll see you there. Panama, Medellin, Bogota. Even, I don't mind You're exhausting. Even to interview, I feel like I need an Adderall. Just to talk with you, man. Just to keep up. I'm, I'm super hyper, man. I, I, I have noticed. like nonstop energy. I got it, man. I love that about you. I meant specifically what's your ETA for a brokerage in Sasua. Brokerage, I don't want to do. I don't want to do real estate. I want oh, to I just thought do the you law said firm. You're opening, I, oh, you're bringing the law firm to Sasua. Gotcha. Okay. That's what I want to do. I don't want to do that. I'm not, you know, I, I got burned by all my, not all, but most of, three out of four managers I got burned. One was great here in Punta Cana. Uh, what do you call it? But the other ones, I got burned. They did me so dirty that I realized oh. that's why I'm here running my business. Right. That if I, I just don't have the bandwidth for that. Okay. And I mean, I'm not ruling it out, but I honestly... I feel like with a law firm, I could do so well with the law firm mm. that I don't want to. If I'm going to open up another branch of my company, I'd rather be in Panama City. Gotcha. You know what I mean? I'd rather do that than kind of move around here because it's actually, believe it or not. So here's the weird part, right? Do you know that it's easier for me to run an office in Panama than it, in Punta Cana in Panama than, Pan than uh, Punta Cana Sosua? You're talking about a, a real estate office or a law firm? Yeah. No, no, real estate office. Real estate. It's okay, easier sorry. for me to run. You know why? Because the flight is only two hours to Panama. And then if I fly out of Santo Domingo, I get a VIP. I go right through. I come right back out. It takes me longer to get to Sosua. I can go to Panama and back and it take me. And I'll still have to won't get to Sosua. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of weird, right? Yeah. Awesome, brother. Yeah, I want to keep you on time. We were at an hour now. So uh, appreciate you, man. Um, how are the uh, Spanish lessons come? You, you've dialed back your... Um, your content on uh, at least appears to me that you have. You don't jump up in my feed as much anymore. Yeah, up in my feed as much anymore. I think I said that right. Um, so uh, how's the um, the Spanish for gringos? So that what happened with that is this. I've got a lot of content. If you actually look and you look at the YouTube that I have and everything, I've been doing a lot of business content. Uh, it, it's just, I, you know, my bandwidth is only to a certain extent and I just forget. And then I remember and I'll grab three videos of like, you know, Spanish for gringos or whatever, or whatever or Spanish, uh, whatever I say. But the thing is, I've been so busy working right now and putting out real estate content, uh, law firm content, which generates business. The other stuff I do for fun, right? But the law firm and the other stuff is business. You know, I give people the projects and stuff like that. So that's all it is. I haven't actually scaled back. I've been putting way more content out. But it's just been more business related instead of like fun. But I will catch up on that as well, you know, because also for me to do that, I've got to be in the mood. Like I'll see something weird and I'll be like, it's Spanish, you know, whatever, it, it, because I'm motivated. Like I'm like an artist. So like, I'll never sit down. Like when you see me do these videos, right, I might have a video planned and I just don't feel like doing it that day. I'm not going to do it. I got to be motivated. I'll be like, all right, I'm going to do the video. All right. I want to tell this guy what happened. I want to tell this story. Like like the one I just put up today with the. Uh, Took me an hour the other day. I was like, I'm in an hour in the freaking uh, line waiting to get my medication because I have insurance. Oh, and it okay. took, I was there like this. I told us I'm growing hair waiting. Oh, my God. You know what I mean? So that I did because it was natural. When I do these videos, it's because it naturally hits me. It's not because right. I like I, I can't do it if I don't feel it. You know I what I mean? I hear you there, man. 
It's a tough gig, this broadcasting thing. So, yeah, lots of luck with the podcast. I hope to be a guest on there one time. I don't know what I could offer a guy of like you, but uh, uh, an ex-realtor, an expat, and stuff like that. It's uh, October. It'll be three years for me here, man. It, time flies down here, man just flies it's slow but fast yeah and you don't know what day of the week it is half the time if you i mean i i do but you know for the first few months i was down here i'm like what what, what day is it it's saturday every day get out of here you know what i mean <laughs> i take my sundays pretty seriously though anyway uh all the links are in the show description uh contact information what else do you need before we get out of here that's it. Have fun. If people have questions, Mario Fama Ed. Also, Mario Fama Ed. If you guys have a business, whether you own it or if you want to submit it, I've created a directory. Oh, there, yeah. If you look on the Sosua, you'll see. Go, if you go to Mario Fama and you look at the directory, you'll find restaurants, hospitals in Sosua, Puerto, uh, Punta Cana. I'm doing it slowly because you know I'm investing out of my own pocket. I have mm -hmm. somebody who does that, and then sometimes people put it in there. I'm working on creating. Besides my recommended providers and just all my videos are up there as well on Mario Fama Ed. Okay, good. I'm working on providing a directory in the major cities of this country so if you're a foreigner if you're a vacation whatever you're coming to punta cana okay let me look over there you'll find the paddle club you'll find the hospital you'll know where to buy furniture you'll know where to buy electro domesticos and stuff like that i'm creating my own personal directory for people to help them i love you brother thank you for your time and uh i'm gonna see you at the end of july i'm gonna come out for an extended weekend i know i almost made your open house and then i talked myself out we had fight night uh the week after i thought for some reason it was the same night so i kind of confused myself in the beginning and then i'm like you know what I, I, this probably isn't like a networking event where i can meet all the boys and girls that mario rolls with and then when i looked at it more closely i'm like ah it's an open house this you know what i mean but it's still probably a networking it event was, to a certain extent it was open house networking and i think i left at like nine o'clock at night because i have a golden rule when we do events and stuff like that my team that i force them i force them off I, I tell them if you don't do this i'm gonna fire you i force them to sit there and drink beers and have appetizers and stuff and we just have to get slammed before we <laughs> before we finish the night that's right. you know, for late. maybe i'll be <laughs> back for labor day then Give me uh, lots like of notice. Then, oh, that's going to be fun. We have a drinks, we have a music, everything. That'll be my second trip out because I wanted to come down for a weekend and kind of see some spots and pick your brain a little bit and shake your hand, put my arms around you, give you some love. It'll be great. Let Can't me know. That, we'll man. coordinate. I'll be here. All right, brother. Love you, man. All right. That's love Mary Fama. Fama. I've been practicing. I don't know why. Soy... So, yo soy, yo soy blanco, pero no soy blanco. I don't know why it's so difficult because I find it hilarious and I love that it's like it's become your open, right? Your identity. And, and not only me, but not only me. I don't know if you've noticed it. There's a girl I speak to her sometimes. She does like the gringa something she's called. She's very oh. big on YouTube and stuff like that. Okay. And she's been using it because people send it to me when other people use it. I get it sent to me. So it's become a thing that has been catching up. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> you know what? Because I've almost got it down. It was funny because I found myself practicing it on the bike the other day. I had a 20 minute drive across town, right? And I, it drives me crazy that these two words that sound a little bit the same and my, there's all the, you know, the basically the same words. You're just saying three words over again in a different, in, you know, and I, it blows my mind that I can't spit it out, you know, and it's a tongue twister. Uh, yeah, it's, a it's been very Sally difficult. Sally sold for seashell me. by the seashore. <laughs> sheesh, 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 sheesh. <laughs> All right, oh boy. Hey, good luck with everything. We'll talk soon. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Take Thanks. care, brother. All right, ciao. Bye. That's how you do that. Mario Fama. Ed, Ed, Ed. RD. Oh, don't take me. No, no. I'm not good with these full screen shots of me. Uh, links are in the show description. Uh, should I force you to watch some um, some more Mario Fama? This is him on the fake book. This is him on the Insta. I looked for him on TikTok. I didn't find him. This is uh, the website. Links are in the show description. Did I say that twice? Three times? Maybe six? Uh, this is the fake book. That we just yeah, that's a video there. Let me see if I can... F I don't know. Now, when I'm under pressure, I won't be able to find one of my, one of my beauties. Um, oh yeah, he's been very 
serious business related. Like if I find this one on the golf course, I'll pee myself. It's it's still I've seen this this clip. Uh, I'm never gonna find it. I've seen this clip probably a hundred times, and it still busts me up. So very entertaining dude. I appreciate this guy a lot, and there's no way I'm gonna be able to find it. I'll just pull something up just for the hell of it and see what we got here. <laughs> Buenos días, mis queridos amigos. Ahora, en esta temporada linda de Navidad, de paz, de amor, te quiero recordar que Santa Claus no existe. <laughs> Nadie te va a dar ningún regalo. Ponte oh. pila y What trabaja en 2024 para obtener que tú quieres en tu vida. What a monster. I can't believe I know what Buenos that días, mis queridos amigos. Said. He just... I can't even repeat what he said. Something about Santa Claus not existing. Ahora. <laughs> you know, that's a very nice, I love Christmas. It's a very nice time, you know, and uh, I just want to tell you that Santa Claus doesn't exist. What a monster. <laughs> I don't like this guy anymore. Hello, everybody. It's your boy, Mario Fama, RD, a.k.a. Yo soy blanco, pero no soy va. <laughs> so, you hate real estate brokers. You despise them. You're one of those guys that get all lied. Oh, they're all crooks. They're stealing money. They're shitting around, <laughs> shipping champagne, making a million dollars a day, and they don't do anything. <laughs> well, let me explain something to you. First of all, I, in my Punta Cana office, am willing to offer a job to anyone who thinks that what we do is easy. Just come on in, survive off the money you make off of real estate. I'd love to document that with you uh, weekly on social media so we can just kind of track your progress and you can show everybody how easy it is to make millions of dollars in real estate doing absolutely nothing. Okay, okay back to the real world now. Now, here's a reason why real estate brokers and brokers in general are never going away. As much as people dislike brokers, think that work is easy that we do or that they do in different aspects that I'm not involved in as brokery, it's because brokers are always going to be necessary. They've tried all this internet stuff, 1%, 2%, whatever, it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because of you, because of me, because of us, the human species. We're terribly, horribly difficult species. <laughs> For one person to sell their goods to another person, often, there's a need for another human being in the middle of these two wonderful, special human beings because we're so difficult at dealing with each other. You know, I am very difficult in certain aspects of it when it comes to selling, you know, I own it, right? People, have, people I feel like don't own themselves up a lot of times. Like I own my, I own it. I'm very difficult when it comes to certain situations in life. I'm a very difficult man. When it comes to sales, I'm not. When I want something, I already talked myself into it. All you gotta do is help me and I'm going for it. I'll talk myself into it. I'll make the sale for you if it's what I want or if I, it's what I think I want. But most people are very difficult and anyone that's ever worked in sales or just your regular job, how many times have you had went home and took a drink because people were so horrible? People are very difficult to deal with. And you know, especially in this day and time, we're getting worse and worse, I think, instead of getting easier and easier. So no matter what happens in this world, there's always going to be a need for a broker. A broker is basically just like a washer. When you have two screws or whatever, you have a washer there, right? We are a washer to make sure that everything works because without us, things tend to fall apart because humans are just horrible at dealing with each other <laughs> and weird and difficult and have mood swings. And I mean, I've seen deals where like an entire, you know, you got a $600,000 deal in there. It's about to die over a light fixture. That's how horrible and difficult people are. <laughs> so as long as we keep being humans, there's going to be a need for a human broker to mitigate between two other human beings to make a transaction happen. We're not going anywhere because we are how we are. I um, uh, he's a hard man to keep up to, for sure. But that's what I like about him. Uh, the links are in the show description. For the tenth time, I'm Jim Fannin. I also sell real estate. I've been doing it for thirty years in Canada. I'm almost three years in Sasua Gabarete now. I work for a brokerage called Viva. Maybe you've seen the Everything Groups in Dominican Republic. A lot of them that have the little Viva logo in the middle, it's a circular logo. That's Clayton Gush, my broker. And um, 
Yeah, maybe you see myself posting uh, new listings on there. Um, I don't, I'm not the guy that goes happy clients, pictures in front of sold signs. I just crush these deals. No, I'm not, never been that guy. But longtime realtor. Um, actually, when I was a member of an MLS system back in Canada, I'm not anymore, but I still hold a license in uh, Ontario. Um, my MLS system had rules that they made for Jim Fannin. Um, in the very beginning, I would, I would get my point and shoot camera. I would put the for sale sign like in the front of the house here and then do a picture of the Jim Fannin Remax sign. And then in the background, you'd see the whole house. So it was like time. It was like promotion in a photo. They made that illegal. I started taking uh, above market commissions because it's the right thing to do. When when everyone's offering two or two and a half percent to the selling broker or the buyer broker, if you offer four, guess what? People work on your stuff harder. They show your listings more and they'll try and get the seller more money really sometimes because it's more money for them. Sometimes they just negotiate it away and that's fine. I end up doing that a lot of times. Uh, but a higher rate of commission, uh, I used to put right in the remarks. Note, SB is 4%. And when everyone else was offering two and two and a half, you get lots of attention and you tell your people, hey, if you don't get full pop, you don't have to pay for full commission. The be oh, little inside baseball here. The best time for a seller to s negotiate a commission with the agents is before they take less than what they're listed at. We know what the contract is. If you get full pop, if you get full list price, the only time you have leverage over the agents is when you take less. Before you take less, you say, well, hey, let's work a deal. What are you guys willing to do for me? You know? So I used to put the remarks, the first remark in the MLS listing would be, note, SB equals four. Now, the public doesn't know what that means, nor do they care that much, but the agents knew. And uh, then... The MLS passed another rule that you couldn't put the commission in the remarks. <laughs> there was a couple other ones. I can't remember what they were, but I call them the Jimmy Fannin rules. The MLS systems actually changed for me because I was genius in the marketing department. Not genius in a lot of things. A couple things I'm good at. Anyways, 905-934-1110. What was the radio station's number? Call now, 610-CKTB. It's, uh, I have to look at the phone. 682-85, it's right down the middle. I can't remember. 934-1110? No, 1-809-330-8926. Buying Dominican Republic at gmail.com. We're on TikTok. We're on the fake book. TikTok's brand new. I've only got about 10 videos up there, and I have one follower. One. So please like me on TikTok. Follow me on TikTok. I'm buying Dominican Republic on TikTok. But we're everywhere. And hello to Kick. Uh, what is this guy's name? Techno Tikentikin? I don't know. Yes, I could see you. I answered you. What's up, Kick? Kick's a new account, but we're broadcasting on the mall tonight. And uh, my thanks to Mario Fama. Erere. Yo, yo soy blanco, pero no soy banco. Look, I almost got it out smoothly. All right, peace, love, hug your neighbor. And I am out.